Okay, so should young patients with uh, mantle cell lymphoma be treated aggressively? So I'm taking the yes position today. Um, just to establish some par parameters for the uh, debate, I thought we should um, clarify what is meant by young. And so for my purposes, I'm declaring young as age 65 and under. <laughs> okay, good, good. We have not uh, colluded in any way. Uh, and uh, I, I chose that because many of the trials use that as an upper age cutoff uh, to evaluate efficacy of intensive therapies. And then we, you know, we need to define what is aggressive therapy. And for this debate, I'm declaring aggressive therapy as any frontline treatment that includes stem cell transplantation or a highly intensive um, immunochemotherapy regimen like conventional hyper-CVAD with alternating high-dose cytarabine and methotrexate. Uh, here are my disclosures, and I have another layer of disclosures, um, trying to boost my credibility with the audience here. I am not a transplanter, and I actually sp have spent much of my career um, studying less intensive approaches for mantle cell lymphoma. And I say in the bullet point, I feel now that I was half right. Um, I think intensive therapies for older mantle cell patients are a mistake, and I, I, I don't recommend it, and I think the data supports that statement, and we'll talk about that very briefly. But I do think that the emerging data does support intensive therapies for this patient population that we're um, discussing today. So I have some predictions. Again, we haven't... We haven't uh, <laughs> We haven't shared our slides, but Jonathan and I have talked about this enough. Uh, he might say in his portion that mantle cell is getting more like follicular lymphoma, and he might say that we need a precision medicine approach to mantle cell lymphoma. And um, if he does, I will say number one is not true yet, and I will say, of course, number two is true. I mean, who doesn't want precision medicine, but I would... I will argue that it's not applicable at this time in this patient population. So um, getting to the data, uh, my belief is that the median overall survival for mantle cell lymphoma has likely improved over the past 16 years. And I picked 16 years because that's when I came out of my fellowship and I, that's when I took a, a real interest in mantle cell lymphoma and I you know, distinctly remember talking to newly diagnosed mantle cell patients and when they were asking about prognosis, you know, I had to quote a median overall survival of three to four years. And uh, two out of three studies in the last uh, several years have suggested the overall survival is improving. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know what it is right now because even if you have a paper that was published, you know, a few years ago, that's looking at outcomes from patients who were diagnosed 10 years ago or so. So who knows what the prognosis for a patient diagnosed in 2016 is right now but perhaps double, maybe even better. Why is that? Well, certainly better disease recognition has helped. Uh, rituximab appears to have had some impact on the disease. I believe stem cell transplantation used judiciously has had an impact, and certainly the addition of novel agents appears to have had an impact. You know, so just to kind of review the, the evolution of frontline strategies over the last 15 years, uh, there's a representative median progression-free survival number for CHOP chemotherapy, which everyone ag agrees is disappointing in mantle cell lymphoma. But uh, in the LENS paper, it was 14 months, and most of the studies that use CHOP came in right around there. Our CHOP didn't add a whole lot to CHOP, but a little, and there's a variety of papers that have looked at our CHOP, and the median progression-free survival would range between 16 and 24 months, depending on the paper, so a little bit of improvement there. The BR regimen, which was really uh, used mostly in older mantle cell patients, got us up over the 30-month mark for median progression-free survival. And VR cap, which substituted bortezomib for vincristine in our CHOP, produced uh, a 24-month median progression-free overall survival. Again, limited to older patients. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin when I was there and in ECOG, we studied the so-called VCR CVAD regimen, which incorporated bortezomib into the induction and then used maintenance rituximab for two years. And our median progression-free survival wasn't reached when we published it, and that was with over three years of median follow-up. So we know it's going to be better than three years 
Um, and those, that was really an all ages population. So we're getting up now around three years with those types of approaches, which I'm not calling these intensive. These are just average approaches. Now, if you start looking at intensive strategies, so here's conventional hyper-CVAD, you know, given the MD Anderson way, published with long-term follow-up. If you restrict the analysis to under age 65, the median progression-free survival is now over five years. So that is the best number we've, I've shown you so far. If you look at the over 65 population, you're now back down to three years. And I looked at a publication from another center to um, University of Pennsylvania where they looked at intensive strategies in older patients. And again, everything came in right around three years. So I don't know why you would put an older patient through that kind of therapy just to get three years. We can get them three years with a variety of less intensive approaches. Okay, back to the younger patients. The CLGB had um, developed a regimen called RM-CHOP. That was published several years ago. Median event-free survival came in close to five years. Uh, Progression-free survival was a little more than five years in that paper. It wasn't quite reached. Uh, so again, we're getting around the five-year mark now if you restrict your trial to patients under 65, which is our population of interest. The median age of most of these trials that restrict the upper age at 65 comes in right around 55, 56. So that's sort of the average patient we're talking about right now. Now, what if you just do RCHOP, plain old RCHOP, full course, six cycles, autotransplant? This isn't published, um, but I have communicated with Martin Dreiling. This was the control arm of, of a big European trial that will be published soon. And the median age in this control arm is 56, and the median event-free survival comes in right around four years. Because of the way they define, defined events, the progression-free survival will be better. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think around five years. But the experimental arm, so now we're getting even more intensive in that arm, which was RCHOP, alternating RDHAP, followed by autotransplant. Median event-free survival is now over seven years. 7.3 years in that paper. Uh, that's not published yet, but will be soon. But if you look at the paper that led to the selection of that arm, that was published in 2013. Uh, from a French cooperative group, median event-free survival came in at seven years. And then finally, if you look at the Nordic regimen, which is the regimen I like the best for this younger patient population, long-term follow-up on that was published in 2012, median age 56, median event-free survival 7.4 years. So we have three series right now where if you take this younger patient population, you incorporate high-dose cytarabine into the induction, give a full course, and then do an auto stem cell transplant consolidation, you can get over seven years for your median progression for your survival, which is, in my opinion, where the, the bar is now set. This just shows the Nordic regimen in a little more detail in case you haven't used it or seen it lately, but it's a, it's a, it's maxi chop. It's kind of a souped up chop alternating with high dose cytarabine. I like this better than the European Mantle Cell Consortium regimen, which uses the DHAP regimen because there's no platinum in here. So we find this to be better tolerated than the DHAP, and it gets results that appear to be equivalent. So these are the curves, the long-term follow-up curve from the Nordic regimen, and it's important to, can I get the pointer working? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the axis down here, this is five years. I mean, this is really mature follow-up. Here's 10 years, and here's the event-free survival curve. So this is where the 7.4 is derived. Here's the overall survival. I do want to point out, at 10 years, it's 58%. Now, remember, the average age in this trial is 56. So 58% at 10 years, hey, that's good. That's much better than we've ever done, but there is still lots of room for improvement here. If if 40% of your patients have died at 10 years, we need to start thinking much bigger and much broader and much bolder than we ever have in mantle cell lymphoma because this is the number that we need to think about improving now for this group of patients. Dr. Friedberg might talk about some innovative approaches. Uh, here is the publication from the Cornell group just recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I asked the question, are novel, less intensive approaches ready for prime time? This was the lenalidomide rituximab strategy as initial treatment for mantle cell lymphoma. And it was a pretty representative mantle cell patient population by MIPI risk. And they did have nice high response rates. And here are the 
here are the outcome or the progression-free survival curve from that paper. And I w what I would say is so far so good, but the median follow-up on this trial is 30 months when this is published. And I really think longer follow-up is essential. You know, I just showed you a curve that that was five years here, and this is 24 months right here. So look at all the patients who are still at risk right now with 18 months, 24 months of follow-up. And take it from somebody who did less intensive trials in mantle cell lymphoma, most of the curves that we had looked about like this with this amount of follow-up, but the, the, the progressions really started to accumulate around year three and year four with these less intensive regimens. So I do think longer follow-up is essential before um, you can say much about the um, efficacy of this regimen. So what about novel approaches? You know, we have these new agents, and so if you have good drugs and salvage, maybe we don't have to be so harsh on the patients with the initial treatment. And it is true, we do have a much better toolbox uh, for the relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma patients than we had a few years ago. Obviously, bortezomib has been around for a while. Temsirolimus is available, approved in Europe, and is available off-label. Lenalidomide is approved for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. Lenalidomide rituximab appears to be more active than lenalidomide alone. Idelalisib has a response rate, although not durable. Abrutinib appears to be the best in this, uh, in this category for relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma with the highest response rate and the best duration of response. And ABT199, a BCL2 inhibitor, is looking promising. So it is true we do have um, a nice range of options here, but Really, if you look at the response rates and the response duration, um, it is possible to burn through this pile of ammunition in relatively short order. And remember, we're talking about younger mantle cell patients here. And um, you know, getting, getting the 56-year-old to 65 should no longer be the goal. It should be more than that. So I'm going to give you one case report just to kind of try to make that point. This is a patient that I've inherited at Washington University, just started caring for him in the last several months. <clears throat> so he was diagnosed in 2011 at age 55, and he was treated with the CALGB regimen that I mentioned earlier, RM-CHOP, plus the ear consolidation, plus a beam transplant. Received that in 2011. Well, he recurred in 2014. And so he's now had a brutinib, which worked for a while, but then he progressed. He then had bortezomib, and he progressed through that. He then had lenalidomide and idelalisib on a study and had to stop that due to severe rash. So he continued on len alone, but had PD. So then he went back to cytotoxics and, and had BR with maintenance, but then he progressed through the maintenance. So his most recent treatment was a novel um, bispecific antibody, and he progressed through that. And so now he's on a novel antibody drug conjugate, and he just received cycle two three days ago. So we don't know yet if that is working for him. He has been denied an allo transplant by um, Medicare. Um, and so this poor man is at age 60 now, and he is rapidly running out of options. Uh, he has really exhausted that list of novel therapy that I talked about, which I think I'm, what I'm trying to make the case here is that we should do the very, very best in the front line that we can do for these patients. And he did receive an intensive regimen, but we now know that he didn't receive the optimal intensive frontline therapy, and perhaps had he received something like Nordic or RCHOP alternating our DHAP, he might have gotten another year or two with his first remission, and we would take that right now, because I'm not sure he's gonna be alive a year from now. So it's cases like that that really make me think that we, that it's no time to back off on our um, treatment approach for these younger patients. Are there young patients who could be spared aggressive therapies? Maybe. Uh, if there are, I don't know who they are right now. Um, by gene expression profiling, we do have a group with a more indolent course. Uh, Dr. Friedberg might go through a paper. You know, he's a ringer. He gets to see all these papers that none of us get to see. This was published online. You could have told me this was coming. Fortunately, one of my spies alerted me. Uh, and uh, this is a brand new paper that just came out online. And um, it's from the European Mantle Cell Consortium, and they... Um, you know, are trying to find better ways to risk stratify. So without going into all the details, it, it incorporates the MIPI with the KI67, and they are able 
Uh, this was in the European mantle cell trial, the younger patient trial, and they were able to identify four risk groups, and by favorable MIPI and KI67 less than, than 30%, you do have this very favorable group. So there is a group of patients who are doing very well, but I would remind you, they're doing very well with the intensive therapy. This curve was generated getting an intensive therapy approach, which to me is an argument to, to keep it going. Finally, it is uh, the low-risk patients by MIPI that have the very best outcomes with Nordic. That's the top-line curve here. So uh, I'm not even motivated to descale the therapy in the low-risk patients when I see uh, data like this. So my closing arguments, uh, the median age we're talking about here is around 56. That's the patient population. We don't know what the median overall survival is right now, but I, th I think it's a fair statement that the reality is that a, a 56 diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma is far more likely than not to die from mantle cell lymphoma. And for that reason, I would say this is not like follicular lymphoma. I do think it's true that mantle cell lymphoma develops resistance faster than other lymphomas. I mean, look at the very high response rates to RCHOP, but the short remission duration. Look at how mantle cell does with ibrutinib compared to CLL. Much worse, you know, by three years, most of the mantle cell patients have, have come off of brutinib. They've developed resistance. That's not true in CLL. So precision medicine is a laudable goal, but I would say it's not really applicable when you have these therapies with these very high response rates, which we do in mantle cell, but most of the patients that we're talking about today are still dying from their disease. So in my opinion, it's premature to you know, plant the victory flag in and, and de-escalate therapy for this population outside the setting of a carefully controlled trial. I think this median PFS of seven plus years is our new benchmark for, for frontline therapy in this patient population. We should really look to, to uh, exceed that with future, with future uh, investigation. So with that, I'll stop and turn the mic over to Dr. Friedberg.